Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody so come back, don't they? Isn't that so? You tried to get into the locked drawer so? today, didn't you? you tried How do the dead come back, Mother? Today, didn't you? You What's the secret? The Pomegranate Seed by Edith Wharton Chapter 1 Charlotte Ashby paused on her doorstep. Dark had descended on the brilliancy of the March afternoon, and the grinding, rasping street life of the city was at its highest. She turned her back on it, standing for a moment in the old-fashioned, marble-flagged vestibule before she inserted her key in the lock. The sash curtains drawn across the panes of the inner door softened the light within to a warm blur, through which no details showed. It was the hour when, in the first months of her marriage to Kenneth Ashby, she had most liked to return to that quiet house, in a street long since deserted by business and fashion. The contrast between the soulless roar of New York, its devouring blaze of lights, the oppression of its congested traffic, congested houses, lives, mines, and this veiled sanctuary she called home, always stirred her profoundly. In the very heart of the hurricane, she had found her tiny islet, or thought she had. And now, in the last months, everything was changed, and she always wavered on the doorstep and had to force herself to enter. While she stood there, she called up the scene within, the hall hung with old prints, the ladder-like stairs, and on the left, her husband's long, shabby library full of books and pipes and worn armchairs inviting to meditation. How she had loved that room! Then, upstairs, her own drawing-room, in which, since the death of Kenneth's first wife, neither furniture nor hangings had been changed, because there had never been money enough, but which Charlotte had made her own by moving furniture about and adding more books, another lamp, a table for the new reviews. Even on the occasion of her only visit to the first Mrs. Ashby, a distant, self-centred woman whom she had known very slightly, she had looked about her with an innocent envy, feeling it to be exactly the drawing-room she would have liked for herself, and now, for more than a year, it had been hers to deal with as she chose. The room to which she hastened back at dusk on winter days, where she sat reading by the fire, or answering the notes at the pleasant, roomy desk, or going over her stepchildren's copybooks, till she heard her husband's step. Sometimes friends dropped in, sometimes, oftener, she was alone, and she liked that best, since it was another way of being with Kenneth, thinking over what he had said when they had parted in the morning, imagining what he would say when he sprang up the stairs, found her by herself, and caught her to him. Now, instead of this, she thought of one thing only, a letter she might or might not find on the hall table. Until she had made sure whether or not it was there, her mind had no room for anything else. The letter was always the same, a square greyish envelope with Kenneth Ashby Esquire written on it in bold but faint characters, from the first, it had struck Charlotte as peculiar that anyone who wrote such a firm hand should trace the letters so lightly. The address was always written as though there were not enough ink in the pen, or the writer's wrists were too weak to bear upon it. Another curious thing was that in spite of its masculine curves, the writing was so visibly feminine. Some hands are sexless, some masculine. At first glance, the writing on the grey envelope, for all its strength and assurance, was without doubt a woman's. The envelope never bore anything but the recipient's name, no stamp, no return address. The letter was presumably delivered by hand, but by whose? No doubt it was slipped into the letter-box, whence the parlour-maid, when she closed the shutters and lit the lights, probably extracted it. At any rate, it was always in the evening, after dark, that Charlotte saw it lying there. She thought of the letter in the singular as it, because, though there had been several since her marriage, seven, to be exact, they were so alike in appearance, 
that they had become merged in one another in her mind, become one letter, become it. The first had come the day after their return from their honeymoon, a journey prolonged to the West Indies, from which they had returned to New York after an absence of more than two months. Re-entering the house with her husband late on that first evening, they had dined at his mother's, she had seen, alone on the hall table, the grey envelope. Her eye fell on it before Kenneth's, and her first thought was, Why, I've seen that writing before. But where? She could not recall. The memory was just definite enough for her to identify the script whenever it looked up at her faintly from the same pale envelope. But on that first day, she would have thought no more of the letter if, when her husband's glance lit on it, she had not chanced to be looking at him. It all happened in a flash. His seeing the letter, putting out his hand for it, raising it to his short-sighted eyes to decipher the faint writing, and then abruptly withdrawing the arm he had slipped through Charlotte's and moving away to the hanging light, his back turned towards her. She had waited, waited for a sound, an exclamation, waited for him to open the letter, but he had slipped it into his pocket without a word and followed her into the library. And there they had sat down by the fire and lit their cigarettes, and he had remained silent, his head thrown back broodingly against the armchair, his eyes fixed on the hearth, and presently had passed his hand over his forehead and said, Wasn't it unusually hot at my mother's tonight? I've got a splitting head. Mind if I take myself off to bed? That was the first time. Since then, Charlotte had never been present when he had received the letter. It usually came before he got home from his office, and she had to go upstairs and leave it lying there. But even if she hadn't seen it, she would have known it had come by the change in his face when he joined her, which on those evenings he seldom did before they met for dinner. Evidently, whatever the letter contained, he wanted to be by himself to deal with it. And when he reappeared, he looked years older looked, emptied of life and courage, and hardly conscious of her presence. Sometimes he was silent for the rest of the evening, and if he spoke, it was usually to hint some criticism of her household arrangements, suggest some change in the domestic administration, to ask a little nervously if she didn't think Joyce's nursery governess was rather young and flighty, or she herself always saw to it that Peter, whose throat was delicate, was properly wrapped up when he went to school. At such times, Charlotte would remember the friendly warning she had received when she became engaged to Kenneth Ashby. Marrying a heartbroken widower, isn't that rather risky? You know Elsie Ashby absolutely dominated him. And how she had jokingly replied, he may be glad of a little liberty for a change. And in this respect, she had been right. She had needed no one to tell her during the first months that her husband was perfectly happy with her. When they came back from their protracted honeymoon, the same friends said, What have you done to Kenneth? He looks twenty years younger. And this time she answered with careless joy, I suppose I've got him out of his groove. But what she noticed after the grey letters began to come was not so much his nervous tentative fault-finding, which always seemed to be uttered against his will, as the look in his eyes when he joined her after receiving one of the letters. The look was not unloving, not even indifferent. It was the look of a man who had been so far away from ordinary events that when he returns to familiar things, they seem strange. She minded that more than the fault-finding. Though she had been sure from the first that the handwriting on the grey envelope was a woman's, it was long before she associated the mysterious letters with any sentimental secret. She was too sure of her husband's love, too confident of filling his life for such an idea to occur to her. It seemed far more likely that the letters, which certainly did not appear to cause him any sentimental pleasure, were addressed to the busy lawyer rather than to the private person. Probably. They were from some tiresome client. Women, he had often told her, were nearly always tiresome as clients who did not want her letters opened by his secretary and therefore 
had them carried to his house. Yes, but in that case, the unknown female must be unusually troublesome, judging from the effect her letters produced. Then again, though his professional discretion was exemplary, it was odd that he had never uttered an impatient comment, never remarked to Charlotte in a moment of expansion that there was a nuisance of a woman who kept badgering him about a case that had gone against her. He had made more than one semi-confidence of the kind, of course, without giving names or details. But concerning this mysterious correspondent, his lips were sealed. There was another possibility, what is euphemistically called an old entanglement. Charlotte Ashby was a sophisticated woman. She had few illusions about the intricacies of the human heart. She knew that there were often old entanglements. But when she had married Kenneth Ashby, her friends, instead of hinting at such a possibility, had said, You've got your work cut out for you. Marrying a Don Juan is a sinecure to it. Kenneth's never looked at another woman since he first saw Elsie Corder. During all the years of their marriage, he was more like an unhappy lover than a comfortably contented husband. He'll never let you move an armchair or change the place of a lamp or whatever you venture to do, he'll mentally compare with what Elsie would have done in your place. Except for an occasional nervous mistrust as to her ability to manage the children, a mistrust gradually dispelled by her good humour and the children's obvious fondness for her, none of these forebodings had come true. The desolate widower, of whom his nearest friends said that only his absorbing professional interests had kept him from suicide after his first wife's death, had fallen in love two years later with Charlotte Gorse. And after an impetuous wooing, had married her and carried her off on a tropical honeymoon. And ever since he had been as tender and lover-like as during those first radiant weeks. Before asking him to marry him, he had spoken to her frankly of his great love for his first wife and his despair after her sudden death. But even then, he had assumed no stricken attitude or implied that life offered no possibility of renewal. He had been perfectly simple and natural and had confessed to Charlotte that from the beginning he had hoped the future held new gifts for him. And when, after their marriage, they returned to the house where his twelve years with his first wife had been spent, he had told Charlotte at once that he was sorry he couldn't afford to do the place over for her but that he knew every woman had her own views about furniture and all sorts of household arrangements a man would never notice, and had begged her to make any changes she saw fit without bothering to consult him. As a result, she made as few as possible. But his way of beginning their new life in the old setting was so frank and unembarrassed that it put her immediately at her ease, and she was almost sorry to find that the portrait of Elsie Ashby which used to hang over the desk in his library, had been transferred in their absence to the children's nursery. Knowing herself to be the indirect cause of this banishment, she spoke of it to her husband, but he answered, Oh, I thought they ought to grow up with her, looking down on them. The answer moved Charlotte and satisfied her, and as time went by she had to confess that she felt more at home in her house, more at ease and in confidence with her husband, since that long, coldly beautiful face on the library wall no longer followed her with guarded eyes. It was as if Kenneth's love had penetrated to the secret she hardly acknowledged to her own heart, her passionate need to feel herself the sovereign even of his past. With all this stored up happiness to sustain her, it was curious that she had lately found herself yielding to a nervous apprehension. But there the apprehension was, and on this particular afternoon, perhaps because she was more tired than usual, or because of the trouble of finding a new cook, or for some other ridiculously trivial reason, moral or physical, she found herself unable to react against the thought. Skyscrapers, advertisements, telephones, wireless, airplanes, movies, motors, and all the rest of the twentieth century, and on the other side of the door, something I can't explain can't relate to them. Something as old as the world, as mysterious as life. Nonsense. What am I worrying about? There, there hasn't been a letter for three months now, 
and not since the day we came back from the country after Christmas. Queer, that they always seem to come after our holidays. Why should I imagine that there's going to be one tonight? No reason why. But that was the worst of it. One of the worst. That there were days when she would stand there, cold and shivering, with a premonition of something inexplicable, intolerable, to be faced on the other side of the curtained panes. And when she opened the door and went in, there would be nothing. And on other days, when she felt the same premonitory chill, it was justified by the sight of the grey envelope, so that ever since the last had come, she had taken to feeling cold and premonitory every evening, because she never opened the door without thinking that the letter might be there. Well, she'd had enough of it, that was certain. She couldn't go on like that. If her husband turned white and had a headache on the days when the letter came, he seemed to recover afterward. But she couldn't. With her, the strain had become chronic, and the reason was not far to seek. Her husband knew from whom the letter came and what was in it. He was prepared beforehand for whatever he had to deal with and master of the situation, however bad, whereas she was shut out in the dark with her conjectures. I can't stand it. I can't stand it another day, she exclaimed aloud as she put her key in the lock. She turned the key and went in. And there, on the table, lay the letter. Chapter 2 She was almost glad of the sight. It seemed to justify everything, to put a seal of definiteness on the whole blurred business. A letter for her husband, a letter from a woman, no doubt another vulgar case of old entanglement. What a fool she had been ever to doubt it, to rack her brains for less obvious explanations. She took up the envelope with a steady, contemptuous hand, looked closely at the faint letters, held it against the light, and just discerned the outline of the folded sheet within. She knew that now she would have no peace till she found out what was written on that sheet. Her husband had not come in. He seldom got back from his office before half-past six or seven, and it was not yet six. She would have time to take the letter up to the drawing-room hold it over the tea kettle, which at that hour always simmered by the fire in expectation of her return, solve the mystery, and replace the letter where she had found it. No one would be the wiser, and her gnawing uncertainty would be over. The alternative, of course, was to question her husband, but to do that seemed even more difficult. She weighed the letter between thumb and finger, looked at it again under the light, started up the stairs with the envelope, and came down again, and laid it on the table. No, I evidently can't, she said, disappointed. What should she do, then? She couldn't go up alone to that warm, welcoming room, pour out her tea, look over her correspondence, glance at a book or a review, not with that letter lying below, and the knowledge that in a little while her husband would come in, open it, and turn into the library alone, as he always did on the days when the grey envelope came. Suddenly, she decided. She would wait in the library and see for herself, see what happened between him and the letter when they thought themselves unobserved. She wondered the idea had never occurred to her before. By leaving the door ajar and sitting in the corner behind it, she could watch him unseen. Well then, she would watch him. She drew a chair into the corner, sat down, her eyes on the crack, and waited. As far as she could remember, it was the first time she had ever tried to surprise another person's secret, but she was conscious of no compunction. She simply felt as if she were fighting her way through a stifling fog that she must at all costs get out of. At length, she heard Kenneth's latchkey and jumped up. The impulse to rush out and meet him had nearly made her forget why she was there, but she remembered in time, and sat down again. From her post she covered the whole range of his movements, saw him enter the hall, draw the key from the door and take off his hat and overcoat. Then he turned to throw his gloves on the hall table, and at that moment 
he saw the envelope. The light was full on his face, and what Charlotte first noted there was a look of surprise. Evidently, he had not expected the letter, had not thought of the possibility of its being there that day. But though he had not expected it, now that he saw it, he knew well enough what it contained. He didn't open it immediately, but stood motionless, the colour slowly ebbing from his face. Apparently, he couldn't make up his mind to touch it, but at length he put out his hand, opened the envelope, and moved with it into the light. In doing so, he turned his back on Charlotte, and she saw only his bent head and slightly stooping shoulders. Apparently, all the writing was on one page, for he didn't turn the sheet, but continued to stare at it for so long that he must have re-read it a dozen times. Or so it seemed to the woman breathlessly watching him. At length, she saw him move. He raised the letter still closer to his eyes, as though he had not yet fully deciphered it. Then... He lowered his head, and she saw his lips touch the sheet. Kenneth! she exclaimed, and went out into the hall. The letter clutched in his hand. Her husband turned and looked at her. Where were you? he said, in a low, bewildered voice, like a man waked out of his sleep. In the library, waiting for you, she tried to steady her voice. What's the matter? What's in that letter? You look ghastly. Ghastly? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I've had a hard day at the office, one or two complicated cases. I look dog-tired, I suppose. You didn't look tired when you came in. It was only when you opened that letter. He had followed her into the library, and they stood, gazing at each other. Charlotte noticed how quickly he had regained his self-control. His profession had trained him to rapid mastery of face and voice. She saw at once that she would be at a disadvantage in any attempt to surprise his secret, but at the same moment she lost all desire to manoeuvre, to trick him into betraying anything he wanted to conceal. Her wish was still to penetrate the mystery, but only that she might help him bear the burden it implied. Even if it is another woman, she thought. Kenneth, she said, her heart beating excitedly. I waited here on purpose to see you come in. I wanted to watch you while you opened that letter. His face, which had paled, turned to dark red. Then it paled again. That letter? Why especially that letter? Because I've noticed that whenever one of those letters comes, it seems to have such a strange effect on you. A line of anger she had never seen before came out between his eyes, and she said to herself, The upper part of his face is too narrow. This is the first time I've ever noticed it. She heard him continue, in the cool and faintly ironic tone of the prosecuting lawyer making a point. Ah, so you're in the habit of watching people open their letters when they don't know you're there. He weighed this out for a moment, then. The intervals have not been regular, he said. Oh, I dare say you've kept a better account of the dates than I have, she retorted, her magnanimity vanishing at his tone. All I know is that every time that woman writes to you, why do you assume it's a woman? It's a woman's writing. Do you deny it? He smiled. No, I don't deny it. I ask only because the writing is generally supposed to look more like a man's. Charlotte passed this over impatiently. And, and this woman, what does she write to you about? Again, he seemed to consider a moment. About business. Legal business? In a way, yes. Business in general. You look after her affairs for her? Yes. You've looked after them for a long time? Yes. A very long time. Kenneth, dearest, won't you tell me who she is? No. I can't. He paused and brought out, as if with a certain hesitation, a professional secrecy. The blood rushed from Charlotte's heart to her temples. Don't say that. Don't. W why not? Because I saw you kiss the letter. The effect of the words was so disconcerting that she instantly repented having spoken them. Her husband, 
who had submitted to her cross-questioning with a sort of contemptuous composure, as though he were humouring an unreasonable child, turned on her a face of terror and distress. For a minute he seemed unable to speak. Then, collecting himself with an effort, he stammered out, The writing is very faint. You must have seen me holding the letter close to my eyes to decipher it. No. I saw you kissing it. He was silent. Didn't I see you kissing it? He sank back with indifference. Perhaps. Kenneth, you stand there and say that. To me. What possible difference can it make to you? The letter is on business, as I told you. Do you suppose I'd lie about it? The writer is a very old friend whom I, I haven't seen for a long time. Men don't kiss business letters, even from women who are very old friends. Unless they have been their lovers and still regret them. He shrugged his shoulders slightly and turned away, as if he considered the discussion at an end and were faintly disgusted at the turn it had taken. Kenneth! Charlotte moved towards him and caught hold of his arm. He paused with a look of weariness and laid his hand over hers. Won't you believe me? he asked gently. How can I? I've watched these letters come to you. For months now they've been coming, ever since we came back from the West Indies. One of them greeted me on the very day we arrived. And after each one of them I see their mysterious effect on you. I see you disturbed, unhappy, as if someone were trying to estrange you from me. No, dear, not that. Never. She drew back and looked at him with passionate entreaty. Well then, prove it to me, darling. It's so easy. He forced a smile. It's not easy to prove anything to a woman who's once taken an idea into her head. You've only got to show me the letter. His hands slipped from hers and he drew back and shook his head. You won't. I can't. Then the woman who wrote it is your mistress. No, dear, no. Not now, perhaps. I suppose she's trying to get you back and you're struggling out of pity for me. My poor Kenneth, I, I swear to you, she never was my mistress. Charlotte felt the tears rushing to her eyes. Ah, that's worse then. That's hopeless. The prudent ones are the kind that keep their hold on a man. We all know that. She lifted her hands and hid her face in them. Her husband remained silent. He offered neither consolation nor denial. And at length, wiping away her tears, she raised her eyes almost timidly to him. Kenneth, think, we've been married such a short time. Imagine what you're making me suffer. You say you can't show me this letter. You refuse even to explain it. I've, I've told you the letter is on business. I will swear to that too. A man will swear to anything to screen a woman. If you want me to believe you, at least tell me her name. If you do that, I promise you I won't ask to see the letter. There was a long interval of suspense, during which she felt her heart beating against her ribs in quick, admonitory knocks, as if warning her of the danger she was incurring. I can't, he said at length, not even her name. No. You can't tell me anything more. No. Again, a pause. This time, they seem both to have reached the end of their arguments and to be helplessly facing each other across a baffling waste of incomprehension. Charlotte stood breathing rapidly, her hands against her breast. She felt as if she had run a hard race and missed the goal. She had meant to move her husband and had succeeded only in irritating him. And this error of reckoning seemed to change him into a stranger, a mysterious, incomprehensible being whom no argument or entreaty of hers could reach. The curious thing was that she was aware in him of no hostility or even impatience, but only of a remoteness, an inaccessibility far more difficult to overcome. She felt herself excluded, ignored, blotted out of his life. But after a moment or two, Looking at him more calmly, she saw that he was suffering as much as she. His distant, guarded face was drawn with pain. The coming of the grey envelope, though it always cast a shadow, 
had never marked him as deeply as this discussion with his wife. Charlotte took heart, perhaps, after all. She had not spent her last shaft. She drew nearer, and once more laid her hand on his arm. Poor Kenneth, if you knew how sorry I am for you. She thought he winced slightly at this expression of sympathy, but he took her hand and pressed it. I, I can think of nothing worse than to be incapable of loving long, she continued, to feel the beauty of a great love, and to be too unstable to bear its burden. He turned on her a look of wistful reproach. Oh, don't say that of me. Unstable. She felt herself at last on the right track, and her voice trembled with excitement as she went on. Then, what about me and this other woman? Haven't you already forgotten Elsie twice within the year? She seldom pronounced his first wife's name. It did not come naturally to her tongue. She flung it out now, as if she were flinging some dangerous explosive into the open space between them, and drew back a step, waiting to hear the mine go off. Her husband didn't move. His expression grew sadder, but showed no resentment. I have never forgotten Elsie, he said. Charlotte could not repress a faint laugh. Then, you poor dear, between the three of us, there are not, he began, and then broke off and put his hand on his forehead. Not what? I I'm sorry, I, I don't believe I know what I'm saying. I've got a blinding headache. He looked wan and furrowed enough for the statement to be true, but she was exasperated by his evasion. Ah, yes, the grey envelope headache. She saw the surprise in his eyes. I had forgotten how closely I had been watched, he said coldly. If you'll excuse me, I think I'll go and try an hour in the dark to see if I can get rid of this neuralgia. She wavered, then said, with desperate resolution, I'm sorry your headaches. But before you go, I want to say that sooner or later, this question must be settled between us. Someone is trying to separate us, and I don't care what it costs me to find out who it is. She looked him steadily in the eyes. If it costs me your love, I don't care. If I can't have your confidence, I don't want anything from you. He still looked at her wistfully. Give me time. Time for what? It's only a word to say. Time to show you that you haven't lost my love or my confidence. Well, I'm waiting. He turned towards the door and then glanced back hesitatingly. Oh, do wait, my love, he said and went out of the room. She heard his tired step on the stairs and the closing of his bedroom door above. Then she dropped into a chair and buried her face in her folded arms. Her first movement was one of compunction. She seemed to herself to have been hard, inhuman, unimaginative. Think of telling him that I didn't care if my insistence cost me his love. The lying rubbish! She started up to follow him and unsay the meaningless words. But she was checked by a reflection. He had had his way after all. He had eluded all attacks on his secret, and now he was shut up alone in his room, reading that other woman's letter. Chapter 3 She was still reflecting on this when the surprised parlourmaid came in and found her. No, Charlotte said, she wasn't going to dress for dinner. Mr Ashby didn't want to dine. He was very tired and had gone up to his room to rest. Later, she would have something brought on a tray to the drawing room. She mounted the stairs to her bedroom. Her dinner dress was lying on the bed, and at the sight, the quiet routine of her daily life took hold of her, and she began to feel as if the strange talk she had just had with her husband must have taken place in another world between two beings that were not Charlotte Gorse and Kenneth Ashby, but phantoms projected by her fevered imagination. She recalled the year since her marriage, her husband's constant devotion, his persistent, almost too insistent tenderness, the feeling he had given her at times of being too eagerly dependent on her, too searchingly close to her, as if there were not air enough between her soul and his. It seemed preposterous, as she recalled all this, that a few moments ago she should have been accusing him of an intrigue with another woman. But then, what? Again, she was moved by the impulse to go up to him, beg his pardon, and to try and laugh away the misunderstanding. 
but she was restrained by the fear of forcing herself upon his privacy. He was troubled and unhappy, oppressed by some grief or fear, and he had shown her that he wanted to fight out his battle alone. It would be wiser, as well as more generous, to respect his wish. Only how strange, how unbearable to be there, in the next room to his, and feel herself at the other end of the world. In her nervous agitation, she almost regretted not having had the courage to open the letter and put it back on the hall table before he came in. At least she would have known what his secret was, and the bogey might have been laid, for she was beginning now to think of the mystery as something conscious, malevolent, a secret persecution from which he quailed, yet from which he could not free himself. Once or twice in his evasive eyes she thought she had detected a desire for help, an impulse of confession, instantly restrained and suppressed. It was as if he felt she could have helped him if she had known, and yet had been unable to tell her. There flashed through her mind the idea of going to his mother. She was very fond of old Mrs. Ashby, a firm-fleshed, clear-eyed old lady, with an astringent bluntness of speech which responded to the forthright and simple in Charlotte's own nature. There had been a tacit bond between them ever since the day when Mrs. Ashby Sr., coming to lunch for the first time with her new daughter-in-law, had been received by Charlotte downstairs in the library, and glancing up the empty wall above her son's desk, had remarked laconically, Elsie gone, eh? Adding, at Charlotte's murmured explanation, Nonsense! Don't have her back! Two's company! Charlotte, at this reading of her thoughts, could hardly refrain from exchanging a smile of complicity with her mother-in-law, and it seemed to her now that Mrs. Ashby's almost uncanny directness might pierce to the core of this new mystery. But here again she hesitated, for the idea almost suggested a betrayal. What right had she to call in anyone, even so close a relation, to surprise a secret which her husband was trying to keep from her. Perhaps, by and by, he'll talk to his mother of his own accord, she thought, and then ended. But what does it matter? He and I must settle it between us. She was still brooding over the problem, when there was a knock on the door and her husband came in. He was dressed for dinner, and seemed surprised to see her sitting there with her evening dress lying unheeded on the bed. Aren't you coming down? I, I thought you weren't well and had gone to bed, she faltered. He forced a smile. I'm not particularly well, but we'd better go down. His face, though still drawn, looked calmer than when he had fled upstairs an hour earlier. There it is. He knows what's in the letter, and has fought his battle out again. Whatever it is, she reflected, while I'm still in darkness. She rang and gave a hurried order that dinner should be served as soon as possible. Just a short meal, whatever could be got ready quickly, as both she and Mr. Ashby were rather tired and not very hungry. Dinner was announced, and they sat down to it. At first, neither seemed able to find a word to say. Then Ashby began to make conversation with an assumption of ease that was more oppressive than his silence. How tired he is! How terribly overtired! Charlotte said to herself, pursuing her own thoughts while he rambled on about municipal politics, aviation, an exhibition of modern French painting, the health of his old aunt, and the installing of the automatic telephone. Good heavens, how tired he is! When they dined alone, they usually went into the library after dinner, and Charlotte curled herself up on the divan with her knitting, while he settled down in his armchair under the lamp and lit a pipe. But this evening, by tacit agreement, they avoided the room in which their strange talk had taken place, and went up to Charlotte's drawing-room. They sat down near the fire, and Charlotte said, Your pipe? After he put down his hardly tasted coffee, he shook his head. No, not tonight. You must go to bed early. You look terribly tired. I'm sure they overwork you at the office. I suppose we all overwork at times. She rose and stood before him with sudden resolution. Well, I I'm not going to have you use up your strength slaving in that way. It's absurd. I can see you're ill. She bent over him and laid her hand on his forehead. My poor Kenneth, prepare to be taken away soon on a long holiday. 
He looked up at her, startled. A holiday? Certainly. Didn't you know I was going to carry you off at Easter? We're going to start in a fortnight on a month's voyage to somewhere or other, on any one of the big cruising steamers. She paused and bent closer, touching his forehead with her lips. I'm tired too, Kenneth. He seemed to pay no heed to her last words, but sat, his hands on his knees, his head drawn back a little from her caress, and looked up at her with a stare of apprehension. Again, my dear, we can't. I can't possibly go away. I don't know why you say again, Kenneth. We haven't taken a real holiday this year. At Christmas, we spent a week with the children in the country. Yes, but this time I mean away from the children, from servants, from the house, from everything that's familiar and fatiguing. Your mother will love to have Joyce and Peter with her. He frowned and slowly shook his head. No, dear, I can't leave them with my mother. Why, Kenneth, how absurd. She adores them. You didn't hesitate to leave them with her for over two months when we went to the West Indies. He drew a deep breath and stood up uneasily. That, that was different. Different? Why? I mean, at that time I didn't realise. He broke off as if to choose his words and then went on. My mother adores the children, as you say, but she isn't always very judicious. Grandmothers always spoil children, and sometimes she talks to them without thinking. He turned to his wife with an almost pitiful gesture of entreaty. Don't ask me to, dear. Charlotte mused. It was true that the elder Mrs. Ashby had a fearless tongue, but she was the last woman in the world to say or hint anything before her grandchildren at which the most scrupulous parent could take offence. Charlotte looked at her husband in perplexity. I don't understand. He continued to turn on her the same troubled and entreating gaze. Don't try to, he muttered. Not try to? Not now, not yet. He put up his hands and pressed them against his temples. Can't you see that there's no use in insisting I can't go away, no matter how much I might want to? Charlotte still scrutinised him gravely. The question is, do you want to? He returned her gaze for a moment, then his lips began to tremble, and he said, hardly above his breath, I want anything you want. And yet, don't ask me. I can't leave. I can't. You mean you can't go away out of reach of those letters? Her husband had been standing before her, in an uneasy, half-hesitating attitude. Now he turned abruptly away and walked once or twice up and down the length of the room, his head bent, his eyes fixed on the carpet. Charlotte felt her resentfulness rising with her fears. It's that, she persisted. Why not admit it? You can't live without them. He continued his troubled pacing of the room. Then he stopped short, dropped into a chair, and covered his face with his hands. From the shaking of his shoulders... Charlotte saw that he was weeping. She had never seen a man cry, except her father after her mother's death when she was a little girl, and she remembered still how the sight had frightened her. She was frightened now. She felt that her husband was being dragged away from her into some mysterious bondage, and that she must use up her last atom of strength in the struggle for his freedom and for hers. Kenneth! Kenneth, she pleaded, kneeling down beside him, won't you listen to me? Won't you try to see what I'm suffering? I'm not unreasonable, darling, really not. I don't suppose I should ever have noticed the letter if it hadn't been for their effect on you. It's not my way to pry into other people's affairs, and even if the effect had been different, yes, yes, listen to me, if I'd seen that the letters made you happy, that you were watching eagerly for them, counting the days between their coming, that you wanted them, that they gave you something I haven't known how to give. Why, Kenneth, I don't say I shouldn't have suffered from that too, but it would have been in a different way. And I should have had the courage to hide what I felt, and the hope that some day you'd come to feel about me, as you did about the writer of the letters. But what I can't bear to see is how you dread them, how they make you suffer, and yet how you can't live without them, and won't go away lest you should miss one during our absence. Or perhaps, she added, her voice breaking into a cry of accusation, 
Perhaps it's because she's actually forbidden you to leave. Kenneth, you must answer me. Is that the reason? Is it because she's forbidden you that you won't go away with me? She continued to kneel at his side, and raising her hands, she drew his gently down. She was ashamed of her persistence, ashamed of uncovering that baffled, disordered face, yet resolved that no such scruple should arrest her. Her eyes were lowered, the muscles of his face quivered. She was making him suffer even more than she suffered herself, yet this no longer restrained her. Kenneth, is it that? She won't let us go away together. Still he didn't speak or turn his eyes to her, and a sense of defeat swept over her. After all, she thought, the struggle was a losing one. You needn't an answer. I see I'm right, she said. Suddenly, as she rose, he turned and drew her down again. His hands caught hers and pressed them so tightly that she felt her rings cutting into her flesh. There was something frightened, convulsive in his hold. It was the clutch of a man who felt himself slipping over a precipice. He was staring up at her now, as if salvation lay in the face she bent above him. Of course we'll go away together. We'll go wherever you want, he said in a low, confused voice, and putting his arm about her, he drew her close and pressed her lips to his. Chapter 4 Charlotte had said to herself, I shall sleep tonight, but instead she sat before her fire into the small hours, listening for any sound that came from her husband's room, but he, at any rate, seemed to be resting after the tumult of the evening. Once or twice she stole to the door, and in the faint light that came in from the street through his open window, she saw him stretched out in heavy sleep, the sleep of weakness and exhaustion. He's ill, she thought. He's undoubtedly ill, and it's not overwork. It's this mysterious persecution. She drew a breath of relief. She had fought through the weary fight, and the victory was hers, at least for the moment. If only they could have started at once, started for anywhere. She knew it would be useless to ask him to leave before the holidays, and meanwhile the secret influence, as to which she was still completely in the dark, would continue to work against her, and she would have to renew the struggle day after day until they started on their journey. But after that, everything would be different. If she could get her husband away under other skies and all to herself, she never doubted her power to release him from the evil spell he was under. Lulled to quiet by the thought, she too slept at last. When she awoke, it was long past her usual hour, and she sat up in bed surprised and vexed at having overslept herself. She always liked to be down to share her husband's breakfast by the library fire, but a glance at the clock made it clear that he must have started long since for his office. To make sure, she jumped out of the bed and went into his room, but it was empty. No doubt he had looked in on her before leaving, seen that she still slept, and gone downstairs without disturbing her, and their relations were sufficiently lover-like for her to regret having missed their morning hour. She rang and asked if Mr Ashby had already gone. Yes, nearly an hour ago, the maid said. He had given orders that Mrs Ashby should not be waked, and that the children should not come to her until she sent for them. Yes, he'd gone up to the nursery himself to give the order. All this sounded usual enough, and Charlotte hardly knew why she asked. And uh, did Mr Ashby leave no other message? Yes, the maid said, he did. Uh, uh, she was so sorry she'd forgotten. He told her, just as he was leaving, to say to Mrs Ashby that he was going to see about their passages, and would she please be ready to sail tomorrow. Charlotte echoed the woman's tomorrow and sat staring at her incredulously. Tomorrow? You're sure he said to sell tomorrow? Oh, ever so sure, ma'am. I didn't know how I could have forgotten to mention it. Well, it doesn't matter. Draw my bath, please. Charlotte sprang up, dashed through her dressing, and caught herself singing at her image in the glass as she sat brushing her hair. It made her feel young again to have scored such a victory. The other woman vanished to a speck on the horizon, 
as this one, who ruled the foreground, smiled back at the reflection of her lips and eyes. He loved her. Then he loved her as passionately as ever. He had divined what she had suffered, had understood that their happiness depended on their getting away at once and finding each other again after yesterday's desperate groping in the fog. The nature of the influence that had come between them didn't much matter to Charlotte now. She had faced the phantom and dispelled it. Courage, that's a secret. If only people who are in love weren't always so afraid of risking their happiness by looking it in the eyes. As she brushed back her light, abundant hair, it waved electrically above her head like the palms of victory. Ah, well, some women knew how to manage men and some didn't, and only the fair, she gaily paraphrased, deserved the brave. Certainly she was looking very pretty. The morning danced along like a cockle shell on a bright sea, such a sea as they would soon be speeding over. She ordered a particularly good dinner, saw the children off to their classes, had their trunks brought down, consulted with the maid about getting out summer clothes, for of course they will be heading for heat and sunshine, and wondered if she oughtn't to take Kenneth's flannel suits out of the camphor. But how absurd, she reflected, that I don't yet know where we're going. She looked at the clock, saw that it was close on noon, and decided to call him up at his office. There was a slight delay, then she heard his secretary's voice saying that Mr Ashby had looked in for a moment early, and left again, almost immediately. Oh, oh, very well, Charlotte would ring up later. How soon was he likely to be back? The secretary answered that she couldn't tell. All they knew in the office was that when he left, he had said he was in a hurry because he had to go out of town. Out of town? Charlotte hung up the receiver and sat blankly gazing into new darkness. Why had he gone out of town? And where had he gone? And of all days, why should he have chosen the eve of their suddenly planned departure? She felt a faint shiver of apprehension. Of course, he'd gone to see that woman, no doubt to get her permission to leave. He was as completely in bondage as that, and Charlotte had been fatuous enough to see the palms of victory on her forehead, she burst into a laugh and, walking across the room, sat down again before her mirror. What a different face she saw. The smile on her pale lips seemed to mock the rosy vision of the other Charlotte. But gradually her colour crept back. After all, she had a right to claim the victory, since her husband was doing what she wanted, not what the other woman exacted of him. It was natural enough, in view of his abrupt decision to leave the next day, that he should have arrangements to make, uh, business matters to wind up. It was not even necessary to suppose that his mysterious trip was a visit to the writer of the letters. He might simply have gone to see a client who lived out of town. Of course they wouldn't tell Charlotte at the office. The secretary had hesitated before even imparting even such meagre information as the fact of Mr Ashby's absence. Meanwhile, she would go on with her joyful preparations, content to learn later in the day of what particular island of the blessed she was to be carried. The hours wore on, or rather were swept forward on a rush of eager preparations. At last the entrance of the maid, who came to draw the curtains, roused Charlotte from her labours, and she saw to her surprise that the clock marked five, and she didn't yet know where they were going the next day. She rang up her husband's office and was told that Mr Ashby had not been there since the early morning. She asked for his partner, but the partner could add nothing to her information, for he himself, his suburban train having been behind time, had reached the office after Mr Ashby had come and gone. Charlotte stood perplexed. Then she decided to telephone to her mother-in-law. Of course Kenneth, on the eve of a month's absence, must have gone to see his mother. Uh, the mere fact that the children, in spite of his vague objections, would certainly have to be left with old Mrs Ashby, made it obvious that he would have all sorts of matters to decide with her. At another time, Charlotte might have felt a little hurt at being excluded from their conference, but nothing mattered but that she had won the day, that her husband was still hers and not another woman's. Gaily she called up Mrs Ashby, heard her friendly voice, and began, well, did Kenneth's news surprise you? What do you think of our elopement? Almost instantly, before Mrs Ashby could answer, Charlotte knew what her reply would be. 
Mrs. Ashby had not seen her son. She had had no word from him and did not know what her daughter-in-law meant. Charlotte stood silent in the intensity of her surprise. But then, where has he been? she thought. Then recovering herself, she explained their sudden decision to Mrs. Ashby, and in doing so, gradually regained her own self-confidence, her conviction that nothing could again come between Kenneth and herself. Mrs. Ashby took the news calmly and approvingly. She, too, had thought that Kenneth looked worried and overtired, and she agreed with her daughter-in-law that in such cases change was the surest remedy. I'm always so glad when he gets away. Elsie hated travelling. She was always finding pretexts to prevent his going anywhere. With you, thank goodness, it's different. Nor was Mrs. Ashby surprised at his not having had time to let her know of his departure. He must have been in a rush from the moment the decision was taken. No doubt uh, he'd drop in before dinner. Five minutes' talk was all they really needed. I hope you'll gradually cure Kenneth of his mania for going over and over a question that could be settled in a dozen words. He never used to be like that. And if he carried the habit into his professional work, he'd soon lose all his clients. Yes, do come in for a minute, dear, if you have time. No doubt he'll turn up while you're here. The tonic ring of Mrs. Ashby's voice echoed on reassuringly in the silent room while Charlotte continued her preparations. Towards seven the telephone rang, and she darted to it. Now she would know. But it was only from the conscientious secretary to say that Mr. Ashby hadn't been back or sent any word, and before the office closed she thought she ought to let Mrs. Ashby know. Oh, oh, that's all right. Uh, thanks a lot, Charlotte called out cheerfully and hung up the receiver with a trembling hand. But perhaps by this time, she reflected, he was at his mother's. She shut her drawers and cupboards, put on her hat and coat, and called up to the nursery that she was going out for a minute to see the children's grandmother. Mrs. Ashby lived nearby, and during her brief walk through the cold spring dusk, Charlotte imagined that every advancing figure was her husband's. But she didn't meet him on the way and when she entered the house she found her mother-in-law alone. Kenneth had neither telephoned nor come. Old Mrs. Ashby sat by her bright fire, her knitting needles flashing steadily through her active old hands, and her mere bodily presence gave reassurance to Charlotte. Yes, it was certainly odd that Kenneth had gone off for the whole day without letting any of them know, but after all it was to be expected. A busy lawyer held so many threads in his hand, that any sudden change of plan would oblige him to make all sorts of unforeseen arrangements and adjustments. He might have gone to see some client in the suburbs and been detained there. His mother remembered his telling her that he had charge of the legal business of a queer old recluse somewhere in New Jersey who was immensely rich but too mean to have a telephone. Very likely Kenneth had been stranded there. But Charlotte felt a nervousness gaining on her. When Mrs. Ashby asked her at what hour they were sailing the next day, she had to say that she didn't know, that Kenneth had simply sent her word he was going to take her their passages. The uttering of the words again brought home to her the strangeness of the situation. Even Mrs. Ashby conceded that it was odd, but she immediately added that it only showed what a rush he was in. But, Mother, it's nearly eight o'clock. He must realise that I've got to know when we're starting tomorrow. Oh, the boat probably doesn't sail till evening. Sometimes I have to wait till midnight for the tide. Kenneth's probably counting on that. After all, he has a level head. Charlotte stood up. It's not that. Something's happened to him. Mrs. Ashby took off her spectacles and rolled up her knitting. If you begin to let yourself imagine things. Aren't you in the least anxious? I never am till I have to be. I wish you'd ring for dinner, my dear. You will stay and dine. He's sure to drop in here on his way home. Charlotte called up her own house. No, the maid said. Mr. Ashby hadn't come in and hadn't telephoned. She would tell him as soon as he came that Mrs. Ashby was dining at his mother's. Charlotte followed her mother-in-law into the dining room and sat with parched throat before her empty plate while Mrs. Ashby dealt calmly and efficiently with a short but carefully prepared repast. You'd better eat something, child, or you'll be as bad as Kenneth. Yes, a little more asparagus, please, Jane. She insisted on Charlotte's drinking a glass of sherry and nibbling a bit of toast. 
Then they returned to the drawing room where the fire had been made up and the cushions in Mrs. Ashby's armchair shaken out and smoothed. How safe and familiar it all looked. And out there, somewhere in the uncertainty and mystery of the night, lurked the answer to the two women's conjectures, like an indistinguishable figure prowling on the threshold. At last Charlotte got up and said, I had better go back. At this hour Kenneth will certainly go straight home. Mrs. Ashby smiled indulgently. It's not very late, my dear. It doesn't take two sparrows long to dine. It's after nine, Charlotte bent down to kiss her. The fact is, I can't keep still. Mrs. Ashby pushed aside her work and rested her two hands on the arms of her chair. I'm going with you, she said, helping herself up. Charlotte protested that it was too late, that it wasn't necessary, that she would call up as soon as Kenneth came in, but Mrs. Ashby had already rung for her maid. She was slightly lame and stood resting on her stick while her wraps were brought. If Mr. Kenneth turns up, tell him he'll find me at his own house, she instructed the maid as the two women got into the taxi which had been summoned. During the short drive, Charlotte gave thanks that she was not returning home alone. There was something warm and substantial in the mere fact of Mrs. Ashby's nearness, something that corresponded with the clearness of her eyes and the texture of her fresh, firm complexion. As the taxi drew up, she laid her hand encouragingly on Charlotte's. You'll see, there'll be a message. The door opened at Charlotte's ring, and the two entered. Charlotte's heart beat excitedly. The stimulus of her mother-in-law's confidence was beginning to flow through her veins. You'll see, you'll see, Mrs. Ashby repeated. The maid, who opened the door, said, No, Mr. Ashby hadn't come in, and there had been no message from him. You're sure the telephone's not out of order, his mother suggested. And the maid said, Well, it, it certainly wasn't half an hour ago, but she'd just go and ring up to make sure. She disappeared, and Charlotte turned to take off her hat and cloak. As she did so, her eyes lit on the whole table, and there lay a grey envelope, her husband's name faintly traced on it. Oh, she cried out, suddenly aware that for the first time in months she had entered her house without wondering if one of the grey letters would be there. What is it, my dear? Mrs. Ashby asked with a glance of surprise. Charlotte didn't answer. She took up the envelope and stood staring at it as if she could force her gaze to penetrate to what was within. Then an idea occurred to her. She turned and held out the envelope to her mother-in-law. Do you know that writing? she asked. Mrs. Ashby took the letter. She had to feel with her other hand for her eyeglasses, and when she had adjusted them, she lifted the envelope to the light. Why? she exclaimed, and then stopped. Charlotte noticed that the letter shook in her usually firm hand. But this is addressed to Kenneth, Mrs. Ashby said at length, in a low voice. Her tone seemed to imply that she felt her daughter-in-law's question to be slightly indiscreet. Yes, uh, but no matter, Charlotte spoke with sudden decision. I want to know. Do you know the writing? Mrs. Ashby handed back the letter. No, she said distinctly. The two women had turned to the library. Charlotte switched on the electric light and shut the door. She still held the envelope in her hand. I'm going to open it, she announced. She caught her mother-in-law's startled glance. But dearest, a letter not addressed to you. My dear, you can't. As if I cared about that now. She continued to look intently at Mrs. Ashby. This letter may tell me where Kenneth is. Mrs. Ashby's glossy bloom was effaced by a quick pallor. Her firm cheeks seemed to shrink and wither. Why should it? What makes you believe? It can't possibly. No, the writing. Charlotte held her eyes steadily on that altered face. Ah, then you do know the writing, she flashed back. Know the writing? How should I? With all my son's correspondence, what I, I do know is... Mrs. Ashby broke off and looked at her daughter-in-law entreatingly, almost timidly. Charlotte caught her by the wrist. Mother, what do you know? Tell me. You must. 
that I don't believe any good ever came of a woman's opening her husband's letters behind his back. The words sounded to Charlotte's irritated ears as flat as a phrase culled from a book of moral axioms. She laughed impatiently and dropped her mother-in-law's wrist. Is that all? No good can come of this letter, opened or unopened. I know that well enough. But whatever ill comes, I mean to find out what's in it. Her hands had been trembling as they held the envelope, but now they grew firm, and her voice also. She still gazed intently at Mrs. Ashby. This is the ninth letter addressed in the same hand that has come for Kenneth since we've been married. Always these same grey envelopes. I've kept count of them, because after each one he's been like a man who's had some dreadful shock. It takes him hours to shake off their effect. I've told him so. I've told him I must know from whom they come, because I can see they're killing him. He won't answer my questions. He says he can't tell me anything about the letters, but last night he promised to go away with me, to get away from them. Mrs. Ashby, with shaking steps, had gone to one of the armchairs and sat down in it, her head drooping forward on her breast. Ah, she murmured, so now you understand. Did he tell you it was to get away from them? He said, to get away, to get away. He was sobbing so that he could hardly speak, but I told him I knew that was why. And what did he say? He took me in his arms and said he'd go wherever I wanted. Ah, oh, thank God, said Mrs. Ashby. There was a silence, during which she continued to sit with bowed head and eyes averted from her daughter-in-law. At last, she looked up and spoke. Are you sure there have been as many as nine? Perfectly. This is the ninth. I've kept count. And he has absolutely refused to explain. Absolutely. Mrs. Ashby spoke through pale, contracted lips. When did they begin to come? Do you remember? Charlotte laughed again. Remember? The first one came the night we got back from our honeymoon. All that time, Mrs. Ashby lifted her head and spoke with sudden energy. Then, yes, open it. The words were so unexpected that Charlotte felt the blood in her temples and her hands began to tremble again. She tried to slip her finger under the flap of the envelope, but it was so tightly stuck that she had to hunt on her husband's writing table for his ivory letter opener. As she pushed about the familiar objects his own hands had so lately touched, they sent through her the icy chill emanating from the little personal effects of someone newly dead. In the deep silence of the room, the tearing of the paper as she slit the envelope sounded like a human cry. She drew out the sheet and carried it to the lamp. Well? Mrs. Ashby asked below her breath. Charlotte didn't move or answer. She was bending over the page, with wrinkled brow, holding it nearer and nearer to the light. Her sight must be blurred, or else dazzled by the reflection of the lamplight on the smooth surface of the paper, for strain her eyes as she would, she could discern only a few faint strokes, so faint and faltering as to be nearly indecipherable. I, I can't make it out, she said. What do you mean, dear? The writing's too indistinct. Wait. She went back to the table and, sitting down close to Kenneth's reading lamp, slipped the letter under a magnifying glass. All this time she was aware that her mother-in-law was watching her intently. Well, Mrs. Ashby breathed. Well, it's no clearer. I can't read it. You mean the paper's an absolute blank? No, not quite. There is writing on it. Um, I can make out something like... Uh, Mine, uh, uh, oh, and come, it might be come. Mrs. Ashby stood up abruptly. Her face was even paler than before. She advanced to the table and, resting her two hands on it, drew a deep breath. Let me see, she said, as if forcing herself to a hateful effort. Charlotte felt the contagion of her whiteness. She knows, she thought. She pushed the letter across the table. Her mother-in-law lowered her head over it in silence, but without touching it with her pale, wrinkled hands. 
Charlotte stood watching her as she herself, when she had tried the letter, had been watched by Mrs. Ashby. The latter fumbled for her glasses, held them to her eyes, and bent still closer to the outspread page in order, as it seemed, to avoid touching it. The light of the lamp fell directly on her old face, and Charlotte reflected what depths of the unknown may lurk under the clearest and most candid lineaments. She had never seen her mother-in-law's features express any but simple and sound emotions, cordiality, amusement, a kindly sympathy, now and again a flash of wholesome anger. Now they seemed to wear a look of fear and hatred, of incredulous dismay and almost cringing defiance. It was as if the spirits warring within her had distorted her face to their own likeness. At length she raised her head. I can't, I can't, she said in a voice of childish distress. You can't make it out either? She shook her head, and Charlotte saw two tears roll down her cheeks. Familiar as the writing is to you, Charlotte insisted with twitching lips. Mrs. Ashby did not take up the challenge. I can make out nothing, nothing. But you do know the writing. Mrs. Ashby lifted her head timidly. Her anxious eyes stole with a glance of apprehension around the quiet, familiar room. How can I tell? I, I was startled at first. Startled by the resemblance. Well, I, I thought. You'd better say it out, Mother. You knew at once. It was her writing. Oh, wait, my dear, wait. Wait for what? Mrs. Ashby looked up. Her eyes, travelling slowly past Charlotte, were lifted to the blank wall behind her son's writing table. Charlotte, following the glance, burst into a shrill laugh of accusation. I needn't wait any longer. You've answered me now. You're looking straight at the wall where her picture used to hang. Mrs. Ashby lifted her hand with a murmur of warning. Shh! Oh, you needn't imagine that anything can ever frighten me again, Charlotte cried. Her mother-in-law still leaned against the table. Her lips moved plaintively. But we're going mad. We're both going mad. We both know such things are impossible. Her daughter-in-law looked at her with a pitying stare. I've known for a long time now that everything was possible. Even this? Yes. Exactly this. But, but this letter, after all, there's nothing in this letter. Perhaps there would be to him. How can I tell? I remember his saying to me once that if you were used to a handwriting, the faintest stroke of it became legible. Now I see what he meant. He was used to it. But the few strokes that I can make out are so pale. No one could possibly read that letter. Charlotte laughed again. I suppose everything's pale about a ghost, she said stridently. Oh, my child, my child, don't say it. Why shouldn't I say it when even the bare walls cry it out? What difference does it make if her letters are illegible to you and me? If even you can see her face on that blank wall, why shouldn't he read her writing on this blank paper? Don't you see that she's everywhere in this house? and the closer to him because to everyone else she's become invisible. Charlotte dropped into a chair and covered her face with her hands. A turmoil of sobbing shook her from head to foot. At length, a touch on her shoulder made her look up, and she saw her mother-in-law bending over her. Mrs. Ashby's face seemed to have grown still smaller and more wasted, but it had resumed its usual quiet look. Through all her tossing anguish, Charlotte felt the impact of that resolute spirit. Tomorrow, tomorrow, you'll see, there'll be some explanation tomorrow. Charlotte cut her short. An explanation? Who's going to give it, I wonder? Mrs. Ashby drew back and straightened herself heroically. Kenneth himself will, she cried out in a strong voice. Charlotte said nothing, and the old woman went on. But meanwhile, we must act. We must notify the police, now, without a moment's delay. We must do everything, everything. Charlotte stood up, slowly and stiffly. Her joints felt as cramped as an old woman's. 
exactly as if we thought it could do any good to anything. Resolutely, Mrs. Ashby cried, Yes! And Charlotte went up to the telephone and unhooked the receiver. Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody dies. So that was The Pomegranate Seed by Edith Wharton. And this is the third of Edith Wharton's stories we've done on the Classic Ghost Stories podcast. We did Bewitched, which is very popular, and we did Mr. Jones. Now, Edith Wharton, because I've done those stories before, I'm not going to go into her biography in any great detail. Uh, but she was born in 1862 into the upper classes in New York, and she died in France, in saint brice sous forêt in France. And she was a Europhile, a Francophile, an Anglophile, she spent a lot of her time in Europe. When she wrote about her background, inevitably, we always do, she wrote about the wealthy in New York, people who had big houses, people who had maids, people who had servants, people who had people draw their bath for them. And this is, of course, the background to this story as well. This guy, Mr. Ashby, is a very wealthy lawyer and he's his wife and he have servants and nannies and they don't really look after their kids and they have their grandmother living nearby who does her own knitting to be fair to her maybe she can't afford to buy her clothes or no I'm being uh, facetious there of course she's doing it as a hobby but all right so Edith Wharton posh as we'd say a, a Britophile or, or rather she uses a lot of Britishisms in her language so she says fortnight instead of two weeks she writes holiday instead of vacation so I felt kind of justified in doing it in my native British accent, even though she was American and, you know, she's a classic American novelist. Because particularly when I'm videoing it, I'm a bit shy about doing accents. When you can't see my face, I'm much happier. Now, whether you think that's a good or a bad thing, I'll leave that up to you. So let's say something about the story. So the pomegranate seed is clearly an allusion to the myth of Persephone and Demeter and Pluto or Hades. And if you don't know the story, which I'd be surprised if you didn't, the daughter, Persephone, is out in plucking flowers, as, you know, people do. She's a bonnie lass and she attracts the attention of Hades, Pluto, the king of the underworld, who is massively rich, but I'm guessing... She's not into goths, okay, because she's not that keen, but he tempts her down, tempts her down into the underworld. And her mother, Demeter, is really upset, tries to get her back, and does get her back. But because Persephone has eaten four seeds of a pomegranate, she has to stay half the year in the underworld. So people talk about this as being a commentary on winter and summer. So we have the fruitful summer, and we have the dur and drich winter. It is not a retelling of that story. In a sense, in the myth, Demeter and Persephone, in one understanding, are aspects of the woman. They're the same person, but aspects, different aspects. And I think that what we've got is the first Mrs. Ashby, uh, Elise, and, oh, is she Elsie? I don't know. Uh, I've forgotten now. Isn't that weird? Just gone poof. I just said her name loads of times. And Charlotte, Charlotte Gorse, I'll always remember that, are kind of aspects of the summer and the winter, the night and the dark, the living and the dead. Kenneth is haunted by the spirit of his dead wife, who is death. He can't get away from it. He wants to. He really strives and wants to have a new life with a new bride who is full of life and offers new ventures and loves traveling and shows him the world. And But he can't get rid of this shadow that haunts him. And again, I think he wants to live, but, but he can't. Uh, Charlotte is life, and she is, she's lively, she's bright, she wants her husband, she fights for her husband. In, inevitably, as we know, she fails, and he disappears with a message to his secretary, actually not to her, that he's going to see about their passage, and inevitably we're reminded of the boat across the river Styx that leads to the Greek underworld. I think also the older Mrs. Ashby is an ally of life. Even though she's old, to use the words like fresh, she's lively, she's plain, she simply has simple emotions, she's not a sombre character. She's pleased that the picture of the ex-wife is gone. She is pleased that the new wife wants to take her son travelling. She is not happy that her son is captured by this gloom. So you could understand it also as depression. Is he depressed? You know, is the spirit of death heavy on him so that he can't live? That's another way of looking at it, I think. Wharton is a great writer. 
she's a proper writer. And what I mean by that, she's not a pulp writer. There's a big debate in between literature and genre fiction. And, and you can say that between plot and character. So literary fiction is really interested in characters and the interactions between people. Whereas popular fiction, genre fiction is about the plot, the narrative, the hook, the story hook going forward. So we've got a bit of both here, really. You can, you can see this story by and large, for about four-fifths of it, as simply a story, an everyday story of the second wife who is... is or oh, there's two, two versions of this. The first is, this is every person with a, their partner who is suspicious, who wonders if they really love them or they're, and there's some secrecy, particularly if there are secrets, you know, it so, sows doubt, so that's one thing. It's a, it's a commentary on the second wife. If, if the first wife goes through... A, um, you know, the relationship breaks down through they don't like each other's adultery or whatever, betrayal, then that's not good, but it's easier than if the, the, the wife dies when he still loves her because the second wife has an impossible task. She moves into the house. All the, this woman's things are around her. Her children are there and she does her best. She tries to look after the kids. She gets on with the kids. She tries to please him. She tries to move furniture around a little bit to put her own stamp on, but that moving the furniture is a metaphor. She can't actually put her stamp on the house. She can't put her stamp on the relationship. It's a story about men and women and second wives in particular and relationships. It's a story about depression. It's a story about being haunted by the death world. In this world, we are, we live and we are given tasks and our job is to be in the world and to have friends and to do things and to work and to create and to love and to enjoy ourselves and to, to deal with the difficult things of being human. The other world, the death world, whence we came and whither we shall go, that's not our business right now. We are here to live, so let's live. But for some of us, the, the pull of the death world is so strong that we never free ourselves from it. Um, and even in daylight, we are haunted by shadow. But really, I honestly do believe we're here to live and we should be living and we should involve ourselves in the things of life um, because we're a long time dead. Or are we? Who knows? Uh, maybe just it's a quick turnaround. I don't know. There's a lot more to be said and I've made some more notes in which case. I've made, had some thoughts in the notes which I haven't been able to wrap it on about. I think it's a really good story. I think she's great, actually. You probably think that. I'm going to do another one of hers, which is Afterward, which is another haunted house country English country house the house beautiful that's a whole genre of stories the house beautiful we've done a couple of those review Kipling's they uh, full circle by John Buchan uh, even the uh, a visit by Shirley Jackson there's there's a whole bunch of them there's lots to come now that kind of segues neatly into the next thing I want to say you know I'm doing a lot of lot well I'm not doing a lot of lives I've done two lives which have been plagued by technical problems and uh, some people have been really kind and supportive actually and even the people who've been criticizing have been kind in the main and even the ones who haven't been kind there's been something to learn from it so I think that's important so yeah the, the first one I had issues with the camera the second one I had issues with the sound the third one which I'm going to do Friday which is going to be Laura Silverbell by J.S. Lefanu and that is going to be perfect the sound is going to be great picture is going to be great people are worried I'm going to replace the old format so the the classic format is me is a podcast it's me not showing my face and hearing my voice. And I've got the sounds really good on those, so that's good. And people love those because they fall asleep to them. And I must admit, I was moderately offended by that to start off with. Uh, but now I'm kind of easy, you know, you do what you want, really. Once I do my bit, what you do with it is up to you. So that's the classic. The next one is the video format. And I did that because um, I wanted to do something slightly different. There are lots of what they call headless channels on YouTube where people don't appear, don't show their faces. And I wanted to, uh, mainly because I bought a camera and I thought, well, I'm going to use it. You know, I've got it, I'm going to use it. And I'm, in, I'm enjoying learning about video making. And you may see that I'm, I haven't learned yet. It's not a past tense thing. And the, the next thing is to try lives. And I need to try premieres. I might even do this as a premiere. So it's all, it's all a learning experience, but I'm not replacing the old format. They will still keep coming. So don't worry. People worry. People worry about things. Don't worry. Everything's okay. There's loads of ways you can support me now. There's in fact so many that I, I lose track. 
Um, so we've got, you can buy me a coffee through Kofi, there's links, and that's great, that's a one-off, no commitment thing. You can join up as a member on YouTube, and I've got members only videos, so you get the videos. You can join Substack or Patreon, and you get the audio, because I can't share videos on those platforms, so if you want the video, free videos, not the free, the members videos, you need to go onto YouTube. I will continue to do the audio versions on Patreon and Substack. I need to have I need to stop having so many channels for support because it's it's hard work. Anyway, that's that's something for the future. But you can do all of those. Um, you can buy a t-shirt now. I haven't got my I've got a Hawkwind t-shirt on today. You know, even if you don't do anything, you actually help me because you listen. The podcast itself, I think we're getting ten thousand listens a week. This is the audio podcast. We've got twelve hundred subscribers on YouTube. So it is, it's really um, growing. I'm gonna do a, a Ray Bradbury, probably for Halloween. Now I'm actually in London on Halloween night. I'm gonna be out, I'm probably gonna do something in London on Halloween night, so I'm not gonna be doing a live radio on Halloween, but I'll have a pre-recorded one to go up. And I'll be, I'll be theming it, Halloween doing th themes, and I've got a couple of my own stories I wanna do. Anyway, that's just the news. So in a nutshell, everything's good, everything is good. I'm happy you're here. And I'll see you again. Okay. Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody Some dies. come back. Don't they? Isn't that Everybody so? Come back, don't they? Isn't that so? Everybody come back. Don't they? Isn't that so? Everybody come back. Don't they? Isn't that so? Everybody come back.